I've often said that scriptures don't teach us so much how to live as to how to die. But this parable is, about, is a parable to live by. Not life that we live, that would be bios, but life by which we live, which is zoe. One zoe, says Jesus, does not consist in the, abundances, uh, the abundance of his possessions. So where does it come from? Well, first, let me convince you that we've got plenty of it because we're filthy rich. Why? Because we are rich in God. Yes, this parable is not about being rich toward God, but in God. Now, if you translate toward God, as most English translations do, you switch people from believing that their riches keep them alive to believing their good stewardship can. Check out A.T. Robertson's grammar or the Beck Bible's Rich in God or the NEB's translation in the sight of God. And that's you. You are most certainly rich, filthy rich in God. 1 Corinthians 3.21 says this of you lay people. All things belong to you. 2 Corinthians 6.10 says of pastors that they are as having nothing yet possessing all things. We're rich, I'm telling you, filthy rich. Isn't that why Paul tells us Jesus came? Doesn't he say this is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Quote, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. We're rich, filthy rich. What would you call someone who, for Jesus' sake, has more forgiveness than they have sins? What would you call someone for whom the mercy of God endures forever? What would you call someone who is gifted with the peace of God that passes all human understanding? What would you call someone who doesn't just have grace, but grace upon grace for Jesus' sake? I would call them filthy rich. And this is me in Christ, as I surely am through my baptism, as I surely am by absolution, as I surely am in having the body and blood of Christ in me in communion. I'm filthy rich. Yet I latch on to fool's gold. I remember my first encounter with fool's gold. I thought I'd found the real thing, a virtual mother load just down the street from my house. My older brother tried to persuade me otherwise, but I knew better. This wasn't nothing, it was something. There was gold in them there ditches, and I was going to pan for it. Well, that didn't pan out. But my brother didn't get my gold either. This fool kept it for many years. The rich fool in the parable did too. Earthly things were his riches. Two things about that. The parable describes the man as rich before his land produced plenty, making him, as they say, filthy rich. Second, see how many times he refers to himself. Twelve times in just three verses. This is Hezekiah showing the Babylonian envoys his treasures. The rich fool does more, though. He refers not only to my barns and my goods, but he has the temerity to refer to my soul. He's the seagulls from, from Finding Nemo. Mine, mine, mine is the liturgy he lives by. What am I saying? That's my liturgy, too. The liturgy of mind is no respecter of persons. Just because most of us clergymen don't consider ourselves rich in things doesn't mean we're free from the green-eyed monster called covetousness. And Jesus himself warns us to not only take care, but to be on guard against all covetousness, even the good kind. Don't you want more health? I do. Don't you want more family time? I do. Don't you want more vacation time, more days off? I do. Come to think of it, there is not one single good thing that I don't want more for for myself. And pretty soon, I've fallen into the cascading of covetousness that the Ninth and Tenth Commandments warn us about. The one thing we covet in the Ninth turns into the one thing after another thing after another 
in the tenth. Now I'm about to get personal. The liturgy of mine that quickly morphs into the worship of more, better, different affects us in search of a better congregation, a better church, a better synod. <laughs> Uh-oh, now I've stopped preaching and I've gone to meddling. But the covetousness that is hardest to see and will eat a hole in your very soul is like the deadliest of temptations. The fruit was good for food. The fruit was pleasant to the eyes. The fruit was desirable to make one wise. So how many nights have I gone to sleep, or more accurately not gone to sleep, worried about someone else's soul? Or the soul of my congregation? Or the soul of a corporation called LCMS Inc.? Why stop confessing here? How many nights have I said to my soul, I have no idea what to do about all the people in the world who are on the road to perdition? How many nights did I ignore covetousness because it seemed, it felt, meet, right, salutary? How many nights have I been careworn and felt so pious for being so? while well, not carrying a fig that my soul was filthy rich in God. You fool, this very night, your soul is required of you. At this point, the law should squeeze a gulp, a gasp, a guilt from our souls, which are still firmly ensconced in these bodies. But I have good news. Your soul, your fallen, foolish, self-impoverished soul was required of Jesus. That's right, you heard me. Before the Lord comes looking for your soul, before the devil comes trying to convince you in a Faustian way that your soul belongs to him because of your many and grievous sins, the Lord required your soul of his son. And Jesus answered. Jesus stepped up. The demands of God's holy law that are laid on your soul were placed on his. He was born under the law. Feel the full force of that word, under. Jesus was born under the law that required perfect keeping. The law is not satisfied like some t-ball coach with you trying your best. The law is not mollified like some TV mom with your promises to never, ever do that again. The law demands holiness, not only in outward deeds, but in all our words and all our thoughts too. Jesus never did what this rich fool and I do. Jesus never thought his zoe came from things so that if he just got everything in, in his bios in right order, he would have a long life of rest for his soul. The law, the law keeping required of every human soul was kept by Jesus. Scripture says that not, not even his enemies could find a just accusation against him. <laughs> my friends, let alone my enemies, enemies could find plenty to accuse my body and soul of, but not Jesus. And it was his soul for mine, his on my behalf, in my place. He kept all God's holy law for me, for you, for all. But that wasn't enough. The punishments the holy law requires of the soul that sins had to be suffered. The debt had to be paid off. The suffering, crying, bleeding, dying required of sinful souls like ours was endured, was went through, and completed by Jesus. He didn't just say, I think it's finished. He didn't say, I hope it's finished. He didn't say, well, it's mostly finished. But it is finished forever. Now, you laymen with confessional pastors, you hear this week in and week out. You pastors need to hear this. If not many of us should be teachers, as St. James says, not a one of us should be without the gospel ringing in our ears regularly. I was in the ministry of 10 full years before I realized that Jesus gave me his body and blood, not just for my sins as a husband, not just for my sins as a father, not just for my sins as a person, but for my sins as a pastor. Though the whole world might hang my guilt, my failings, my sins as a pastor around my neck, Jesus did not. Jesus finished 
paying not only for my sins, but the whole world's. And God the Father announced that he had accepted the sacrifice of his body and soul for all lost souls by raising him from the dead. And Jesus came forth from that tomb, breathing not revenge, not threat, but forgiveness. He breathed peace into the sinful souls of the apostles who had denied and deserted him and then sent them out into the world preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins. We who have heard and believed this are filthy rich. Rich beyond compare. So let us make merry in these next few days particularly. Let us make merry, not on the basis that the rich fool proposed to or the way the rich man did in the face of Lazarus, but the way the prodigal son made merry in his father's house. All three places are using the same Greek word for to make merry. But the fools who are rich in things of this bios revel in these, these things as an end, as if they were things by which they live zoe. The father proposes we make merry on the basis that the prodigal son who was lost is found, who was dead now lives, zao. So they made merry, all except the elder son who didn't think he was rich. Even the father, even though the father had told him all that he has belongs to him too. Those who know their rich make merry on the basis that the lost have been found, the dead now live zao in Christ. They use the things of this bios as a means to celebrate that's what, that which really gives zoe. Not only here, but hereafter. Not just for now, but forever. Let us then, these next few days, make merry by the mutual conversation and consolation of the brethren. Let us rub into each other's ears the promises of the gospel so that we may go home from here convinced, convinced that since our souls are in good hands, nail-pierced ones, we are filthy rich, not in a parable, but in life. Amen.